Welcome to this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I'm your host, Real Joe Quinn. Recording this on a Thursday as we are, you know, thankfully, seemingly headed towards uh, uh, spring. Spring has seemingly arrived, but hopefully we'll go back to some of this back and forth weather. You know, it is March Madness, so you never really know with March. You never, I mean, you never, never know with March. Um, we got a lot to cover on this podcast. We're going to do, obviously, some a, lot, a ton of NBA, but also some NFL, too, as we are nearing, getting closer and closer to the NFL draft, which is a little over a month away. Uh, we are, are, also, we are in the midst of NFL free agency as well. Baseball season will be coming up. The conference tournaments for the NCAA, college basketball are uh, absolutely in full swing. Duke, of course, lost tonight. I was kind of hoping that they would, would win the so they can get to North Carolina on Saturday and North Carolina can, you know, possibly get a number one seed. But North Carolina might get a number one seed regardless if as long as they win the as long as they win the ACC tournament. But teams, the rich get richer in more ways than one. Um we'll discuss that over the course of this podcast. We're gonna begin with the deep dive, the NBA's defensive turn. So since the all star break coming into last night, teams were scoring um, four points. Uh, scoring was down. Teams were scoring four points a game less. Uh, so basically, an average of one fifteen, an average of one eleven, in terms of the cumulative scores of these games. Uh, free throw attempts are also down by five point three uh, per game. We've seen some just crazy defensive games. Uh, there was a a ninety to eighty six game between the Clippers and Minnesota uh, about a couple weeks ago. A little about. A week and a half ago, then you know Philadelphia and the Knicks, you know, seventy nine, seventy three game, uh, like a little over a week ago. A week ago, so there have been so clearly, clearly, the message uh, was sent loud and clear to the NBA officials that you know what we need to calm down. You know, the scoring is a little bit out, a little bit out of control. We need, to, we need to start the playoffs, basically start the playoffs now. And that's what's happening. This is These games are being officiated like playoff games, like right now. Okay. And again, I don't want to watch a game, fight, frankly, in 2024, that's 79 to 73. And I don't want to watch a regular season game that's 90 to 86. To be honest with you. To be perfectly honest with you. Um, I'm fine with great defense. I'm fine with not having a thousand foul calls. But again, you know, you can complain if you're the NBA about the scoring. Coaches can complain. Everybody can complain. But what you don't want to do is go back to circa 2003, 2004, when teams were struggling to crack to, uh, to crack 90 points. We don't want to go back to that. We don't want to go back to that at all. Okay. And I don't want to hear any complaining if this if this trend continues. I don't want to hear shit about, okay, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. It's too much defense. I was fine with the regular season. I was fine with the scoring. I I told you on, a, on like the, about a month ago, I told you the skill level of these players is is out of this world right now. Like the skill, the, the offensive skill sets of some of these players is at an all-time high. It is positionless basketball. It's almost impossible to guard these guys right now. Period. All these guys can euro step, step backs, counters on top of counters, jump shot. You know, three unlimited three point range. It is almost impossible to guard these players right now. Do I like a game with a million foul calls? Of course not. But for the most part, I'm gonna be honest with you. I. Uh, the flow of these games were fine with me. I didn't walk away thinking about a lot of these games where it was a situation where, oh man, I, you know, I think it's excuse me, I think it's too many foul calls. It's not too many games I watched this season and walked away feeling that way or complaining about the officiating. Now listen, the officiating has not been good this year, but that has nothing to do with the uptick in offense. Like those are two separate issues. Like the officials are just the officials have not just been good. Period. With consistency and quick technical fouls and and what have you, some blatant missed calls, 
But that has nothing to do, like I said, that has nothing to do with this outburst, outburst of, uh, of offense that's at, that is at an all-time record high, record rate in the NBA. So, again, listen, you want to start the playoffs now? Cool. Playoffs start in April. Look, cause this, listen, this is this is all you're watching. All you're watching right now is how, officiate, how officials are going to ref the play, are, are going to officiate the playoffs. And you couldn't tell you, – you're telling me you couldn't wait People who were complaining couldn't wait till April. So middle of April for this to happen. You couldn't wait till April. I mean, really? I mean, that's because this is, I mean, this is how the, the games are going to get, get officiated in April, in April through June. And normally you see less foul calls and scoring goes down in the playoffs. So I, you know, we don't have like I, I don't have any I, I I don't really have a major problem with it. Um a lot of these games have felt like playoff caliber games um you know over the last week or so. Again, I don't want to see a game I don't want to see a situation where we're getting the games are played in the nineties uh over the course of the regular season. Like I I don't want to see that at all. The question, here's the major, here's the big question, right? What happens when we get to the playoffs? Like what happened? Like what does I mean, does this trend continue? Will we see even more less foul calls, more physicality? And who does that favor? Like who like who's gonna be the biggest, who is gonna which which teams are gonna be the biggest beneficiaries? Of this uh, moving forward, uh, once we get to when we get to April, that's the question. So, listen, the NBA got his wish. Joe Dumars, Adam Silver, what have you? You know, in a in a couple of probably a couple of coaches got their wish. Um, the scoring has definitely been noticeable over the past couple of, since the All Star break, and especially since we since the term since March started, it's been very noticeable. As far as uh, the, the lack of not lack of scoring, but the scoring, but the scoring going down. Uh, again, what is this? What is this going to look like uh, with uh, when April comes? A couple things around the NBA, um, and this is why I can't. This is why you can't trust the Los Angeles Clippers. Uh, Kawhi left the, left a game with a back injury, a loss to Minnesota. They were in control of the game when he when he was in, and Minnesota Anthony Edwards just exploded in the fourth quarter, and Minnesota ran away from ran away with the game uh, a couple of nights ago. He left with a back injury that apparently was so bad that he could not couldn't sit down and left the arena. And there's no anytime Kawhi you know coughs the wrong way, you have to be nervous. You're a Clipper fan, period. Like this, so there's no such thing as a minor injury when it comes to Kawhi Leonard. Now this year, he he has been for the most part relatively healthy. This year, uh, he's played in played in uh, a ton of games. Should be eligible to probably make the. Uh, he should reach. Probably, I don't know what, what you know what, depending on how long he's gonna be out now, but was on pace to reach that 65 game mark. That's you know. That can uh, have him eligible, for, like possibly first team All NBA and some of the awards that are connected with those uh, with that threshold, and uh, which should make the awards interesting as well because they're going to be, they're gonna be a number. They're going to be some spots open because some certain lot you're going to have some All NBA caliber guys who are going to be eliminated because they haven't reached that 65 game um, that 65 game max to uh, make first team All NBA and to win some of these awards, these postseason awards, but. If you're a Clipper fan, you know it's here we go again with Kawhi. Like I, I, I don't. There's like I said, there's no such thing as a minor injury with him. It's something that you're gonna have to monitor uh, throughout uh, for the rest of the season. And again, he like he already had leg injuries, so like a back. That is the last thing that Kawhi needs. Um, and, uh, you know, with his already injury riddle injury riddle history of his career and. Again, I, I just, I, you know, Clippers, something was going to happen with the Clippers. It always does. Uh, injury. Like, when is the last time? I mean, as a matter of fact, when is the last time Kawhi played a full, a, a full, post, a full postseason? I mean, Kawhi, Kawhi hasn't played. I don't look this up now, but 
Kawhi, I don't think Kawhi has played in a full postseason since the bubble. Um, since the bubble in 2020. You know, I'm looking it up right now, but listen, the guy he can't stay on the floor. He cannot, I mean, he cannot stay on the floor looking at his uh, basketball reference up now. And again, if you're Ty Lu, it's like, you know, what can you do? Like, <laughs> what, you know, it, you know, you have to, you know, resort to, you know, with these different lineups, um, you have to resort to just being used to not, used to being accustomed to not playing with this dude. Um, all right, so Kawhi playoffs, 2020, yeah, 13 games that got eliminated. 21, he played, that's when he got hurt against Utah. Um and last year he only played two games, and of course he had he, he went out with that knee that knee injury. So has not played a full playoff season since twenty twenty. Since twenty twenty, he has not played a full yeah hasn't played in a full playoffs. He had back to back, but they won a champ. He wins a championship with Toronto. Played twenty four games. Of course, he won the NBA Finals MVP. The following year, played in the bubble. Um. Even going back to 2017 with the Spurs, he got hurt. Remember with Zaza Pachulia went under him and, you know, he messed his ankle up. So he, again, he has not been healthy in the playoffs uh, for the most part. Like, they won the championship in 14. They lose the seven game. He lost seven game series when he's with San Antonio in 15 to the Clippers. Then 2016, they made it to the semifinals and lost. And he had been relatively healthy up to that point, but of course, 2018, he had the injury where he didn't play at all. Um, yeah, he's only played in his career. He's only played 137 playoff games in his career. He's been in the league since 2011. And in the last three, you know, the last four years, he has only played 20, in 26 playoff games. In the last four years, since 2020, he's only played in 26 playoff games. So, again, I, I just... I, I can't. I just can't trust the Clippers. I can't. You can't trust them. You can something. Something is going to happen. It never fails, and there's no way. Like I said, there. I between he and Paul George, uh, there's no way that I would ever bet that they could make it through an entire playoff run without something happening, especially when it comes to injuries. And again, that they were probably going to be Denver's biggest. Uh, you know, as far as matching up, as far I still think I still, still think it's Minnesota from a matchup standpoint with this Minnesota size, but from an experience standpoint and from a standpoint of depth, the Clippers probably would have been uh would be uh one of the tougher matchups, if not the toughest matchup for uh the Denver Nuggets. And you know, then we and even with that said, Denver has owned the Clippers uh since the NBA, since the bubble in two thousand twenty. So I even even healthy you would favor the Clippers. You would favor Denver in that series. But now it's kind of like, you know, well, is next team up? Like, who's the, the, the question is who's going to be playing Denver Nuggets in the Western Conference Finals and who's going to be the biggest threat to them? And right now, in terms of matchup, you probably have to say the Minnesota uh, Timberwolves, especially if they, if they get help, if they get Carl Anthony Towns back before the playoffs, which they should. Uh, that they probably are the biggest uh, between them and maybe maybe the Lakers. So, so the West, the West, which at one point looked deep, really, um, and when you look at the Western Conference, it, you know, things are really clearing up for Denver right now because, uh, you know, Oklahoma City is young. Um, the Clippers are beat up. Uh, you look at, um, you never know with Minnesota. Like Minnesota, again, they're banged up as well. Carlton Town should be back, but they still, you know, they – they have they they have a tough time closing down the stretch in games, um, especially as uh, with and with you know with Anthony Edwards uh, fourth quarter scoring. But I still think Minnesota is their toughest matchup. Do you trust New Orleans? Do you trust that Sacramento, Dallas, Phoenix? No, I mean I I just don't. Uh, so I think you know I think right now Denver's number one right now, and they would face you know a 
you know, they could face the Lakers. They could face Phoenix in the first round. I don't know. I, I honestly don't think it matters who Denver plays in the first round, to be honest with you. It would, but it's Dallas, Phoenix, LA, Golden State. I don't. I think Denver. I don't think it matters. I don't. And then the way it's set up right now, Clippers and New Orleans are four or five. I mean, neither, like Denver to me has a probably a clear path to the Western Conference Finals. They really did. Like it's not as tough as I thought that it was going to be for Denver to get back. It's thought that the West is just not as tough as as it looked a couple of weeks ago. And a lot of it, some of it has to do with then a lot of it has to do with uh inexperience at the top, but also injuries. You know, Carl Anthony Towns, Kawhi Leonard, uh, you know, LeBron with his ankle. Who knows about that from that standpoint? And you got team you got three teams that just can't be trusted. The Clippers, the Clippers, the Hornets, excuse me, the Clippers, the Pelicans, and the uh Kings. You can't trust these teams. You can't. Especially, in, especially in, in, in key playoff moments, fourth quarter games where they get down to a, a possession here, a possession there, uh, Denver is clearly heads and shoulders above everybody in the Western Conference. And, you know, you know, separate themselves. They won nine out of their last ten games. Um, Jokic is going to win another MVP. To me, uh, so you know, there, that's there you go with with uh, the Western Conference from that standpoint. Um, you know, we were. I was ready to get back on the Milwaukee bandwagon. Uh, they had some. They had a great win against. Um, coming off the break, they started out like six and zero. Coming off the break, had a great win against the Clippers, um, against Minnesota on the road, and then against the Clippers. But they went on the West Coast trip, and it was it was an absolute disaster. They got destroyed. They get destroyed by. Uh, I mean, absolutely manhandled in a couple of these games. They were out, they were outscored in an average of one twenty three to one hundred seven. So the defense completely regressed uh, on that West Coast trip, and you know they lose a one point game to the Lakers with no LeBron. That was a horrible loss. They get absolutely smoked um, by the Kings and got destroyed. And, and this one, this was the worst loss. They got. Destroyed by the uh, Golden State Warriors, which was a horrible loss, and I said the game wasn't even, that game wasn't even close. So Milwaukee, when you thought Milwaukee was on its way to possibly making a run, um, not at the Celtics in terms of catching up a number one seed, but when you thought that they possibly had turned somewhat turned the corner, they're playing great defense. They have certainly have taken another step back. One and three coming off the uh, coming off that West Coast trip. I know they're winning tonight as we speak. As I'm recording the podcast, they're winning, but they're struggling against a Sixer team without Joel Embiid. Uh, I think Milwaukee. Yeah, they're they're going to win this game. But again, the Sixers, you know, don't have Joel Embiid, and um, so it's a game that they absolutely should win. By the way, and you know, just you know, with Milwaukee. Listen, here, here's what it comes down to uh, with Milwaukee. And I said this before the season. You know, everybody's focused on uh, the Lillard and um, Giannis chemistry and, you know, the pick and, their pick and roll and all this other stuff. Milwaukee coming into the season was, was going to come down to one guy, and that was Chris Milton. Chris Milton either has been ineffective or can't get on the floor or can't stay on the floor. That's all there is to it. When they won a championship in 2021, you had basically a three-headed monster of Giannis, Drew Holiday, and Chris Milton. Chris Milton won them a number, a few playoff games. He had a, I think he had a forty-point finals game. Okay, he was playing. He was playing at an all-star caliber level in that playoffs. He had a great, excellent playoff run in twenty twenty-one. That version of Chris Milton is done, and they needed somebody. They needed. They needed. You know, giving up the defense for Drew, with Drew Holiday, they needed. And you know, Di Vincenzo, that that hurt as well. But they needed it about eighty-five to ninety percent of what Chris Milton was in twenty twenty-one. And right now, that this version of Chris Milton is just not good. It's not gonna. It's not gonna work. It's not gonna like he. You know, like I said he either can't stay on the floor or he's been you know basically a non-factor when he's been on the court. You know, he's had a moment. He, I mean, he's kind of been like the Eastern Conference version of of, of Clay of, of Clay Thompson in some ways. In terms of what he used to be, I mean that's how poorly he's played, and that was what the Bucks was going to. That was what their season was going to come down to. 
like what like Chris if if Chris Milton who somewhat could return to form of where he, where he was at a couple of years ago, they would be in excellent shape. If he couldn't, they had no chance. They have absolutely no chance to get to a, to get to the finals to even get out the Eastern Conference without Chris Milton. So you can talk about Giannis and Damian Lillard and that their chemistry all you want. The lack of defense, no. It is about this. This the key to the Bucks is Chris Milton. I know what I'm getting out of Giannis. I know what you're gonna get. You know what you're gonna get out of Dame Lillard, even though he hasn't played as well as they as you know as he as you you know as as he was expected to. But still, I mean, he's still producing at an at an all all star caliber level. But still. To be clutch in, in four quarter games and still capable of getting you on a given night 35 to 40 points on a given night. And he's, I mean, he's not going to shy away from any big shot or big moment. So I'm, Damian Lillard is fine. I'm fine with Damian Lillard. You know, he, he, that's not, he's not, that's not the problem. The problem is Chris Milton is the fact that they've had no Chris Milton. That's the problem with the Bucks. Even when the, that between that and they're just lackluster, just, Effort and concentration on defense, which is you know, again, they should not be, they should not have been this bad defensively. They just shouldn't have. But the key, even when you know, even when their defense, even with their defense improving, you know, in the fourth quarter, you get in these playoff games, you need playmakers that you need guys that can create offense and guys that can get buckets in the fourth quarter. And again, you watch Chris Milton twenty twenty one. There was a the guy that can get his own offense, can create for other people, and it can get buckets in the fourth quarter. Chris Milton was not afraid to take big moments and to take big shots in the fourth quarter during that, especially during that 2020, that 21 uh, run to a championship. He had some huge games, some big time games, especially you remember when Giannis went out in that, that uh, Atlanta series, they won the last two games without Giannis. Okay, they won games, games five and six without Giannis. And then you know you get to the finals. He had a, again. He had a big. He had a, uh, he had some big games in the finals. So you know Milwaukee is not going to happen. But it looks it's just not going to happen for them this year. Um, I thought they were going. I thought they were on their way back, but they just too much going on with them right now. I don't. I don't think that they can turn it around all of a sudden. And all we get to April, and all, and you know, here comes Milwaukee. Now, again, anytime you have, you still have Giannis. You still, you know, at worst, the second best player in the world. So you're always going to have a chance with that guy on your team. But uh, I don't see it happening for Milwaukee. And I wouldn't be surprised if they had another early exit. They maybe can win, will, will can win one round, and then get put and possibly get put out in the second round. I would not be surprised if Milwaukee went out. Doesn't I would not be shocked if they don't make the Eastern Conference Finals. At this point, I would be a little bit surprised if they do uh, make the Eastern Conference Finals. And the East is not very strong, um, to say the least. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen with Philadelphia in terms of Joel and Joel, in terms of Joel and B. And again, in a series against Miami, you, you're picking, I'm sorry, you're picking Miami. I'm sorry. <laughs> this is Milwaukee versus Miami. You are absolutely picking Miami. That's all there is to it. Uh, as far as the NFL free agency goes, a uh, very interesting week of free agency to say the least, especially at the quarterback spot. First, let, let's start with um, Russell Wilson, because I got a lot on, on Kirk Cousins. Russell Wilson going to Pittsburgh uh, for a minimum deal is a perfect signing for Pittsburgh. You get Russell Wilson absolutely on the cheap. Um, they got rid of Deontay Johnson. It's not a big deal. Um, but this, listen, this is, I normally, you know, I know I, I came on here and said that I don't. I wouldn't pick up Russell Wilson because I don't think he can take you over the top. But if you can get, if you can only get him, if you like, you can't. If if you need a quarterback and you're saying, hey, you're only going to play, I can. Only, I'm only going to pay him like one point two million dollars. Then that's too. That's too hard to pass up because now, um, now he could be a guy that can lead you to your next. Uh, big time quarterback or to your next friend, possible franchise quarterback. Like he, he can be that guy. Is he, is, is he going to lead Pittsburgh to a championship or to a even conference championship? No, it's not going to happen. Especially in the AFC, the AFC is loaded with with top quarterbacks. But if you're Pittsburgh, he bought you another year. Bought you another year. So I have no problem with that. I actually like. This deal for Pittsburgh more than I like the next deal in terms of who I'm who I'm going to mention next for Atlanta. Kirk Cousins gets four years, hundred eighty million dollars. Kirk Cousins, 
I don't know what his religious affiliation is, I, but he has to be living right. Kirk Cousins is going to end up making $250 million in salary and possibly in total of $400 million and possibly in career earnings. This is a guy who was drafted in the fourth round of 2012 draft. This is a guy who has one playoff win in his career. Okay. And I know he's put up some excellent numbers. He's been very productive. Uh, he's made a Pro Bowl. He's a very good player. He is a he is in, he would be in the hall of very very good, but he he's not a guy that's going to move the needle, that's going to take your franchise to another level. We are we understand what the ceiling is for Kirk Cousins, but give his agent all the credit in the world. Give him all the credit in the world. He has played his cards perfectly when it's come to contract negotiations. Now for Atlanta, I totally don't understand why. You sign Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins does not put you in the, the – maybe you might make the playoffs. You might make the playoffs, but he does, definitely doesn't put you in the conference championship or let alone the Super Bowl. Like, like that, he just doesn't do that. Now, could, could Kirk Cousins get them a division title? Sure. That division, that division is going to be wide open until somebody – until there's a, until another quarterback emerges. And you look, at, you look at the division right now at the current state of it, he – Probably pound for pound is the best quarterback in the, in the division, but they ain't, that's not hard to be because none of those teams, Tampa, New Orleans, Carolina, right now really have a quarterback. And all due respect to Bryce Young, um, you know, I got to see, you know, we'll, we'll see him when he's standing up straight. I know he got destroyed with his offensive line this year, but it, it, being, being the best quarterback in that division doesn't mean much because it's not a quarterback laden division, to say at least. It's a, one of the worst quarterback divisions in, in, the, in, the, in the NFL right now. I would not give it again. There's no way in the world I would have given. I would have signed Kirk Cousins if I'm Atlanta. It makes zero. It, it would have made more sense for them to go after Russell Wilson, or just, or just go, or just you know go the route of a journeyman, uh, of a journeyman guy on the cheap that you can uh, use as a stopgap to uh, get to your next to to get to your next guy. I'm not giving Kirk Cousins like what Kirk Cousins gets. <laughs> Uh, I'm not treating Kirk Cousins like he is the next guy that he can put us over the top. They gave him the money that he got. You're paying a guy that you're saying that we're basically a quarterback away from um, from being a Super Bowl contender. That's the money Kirk Cousins got. And there's no way, there's no way that I'm giving Kirk Cousins that type of contract. And to put it in perspective with Kirk Cousins' career, possible career earnings of over $400 million, dollars. That is more than Kevin Durant and and the late Kobe Bryant. Now I'm not count. You don't count endorsements because certainly with endorsements, both of those would probably would be Kobe, Kevin Durant, Garnett. Excuse not Durant, Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant would far exceed the four hundred million dollars if you include endorsements. But just based off contractual uh, salaries, he would he has a chance to make more than both both Kevin Durant, excuse me, Kevin Garnett and Kobe Bryant to a top. Probably twenty players in, or you know, depending Durant, probably like Garnett, probably having that top that twenty to twenty five range, or maybe that fifteen to twenty range. But two, two of the top twenty players, 20, 15 players, two of the top twenty players in NFL and NBA history, right? That Kirk Cousins, Kirk Cousins, is going to exceed in career earnings. Late in the in the words, the words of the the great Don King, only in America, only in America. Only in America. And I'm not calling Kirk Cousins mediocre, but boy, you talk about overachieving and winning in life and, and professionally, like Kirk Cousins is out here winning. Y'all can tell you, I can say what y'all want about Kirk Cousins. Kirk Cousins came, like I said, he came in the draft with a good, he came in the draft with the Heisman Trophy winner, right? Far outplayed him. Far outplayed him, RG3. Far outplayed him. And again, this just continuously signs big contracts. <laughs> so I, I'm not, listen, I'm not, I'm not mad at him. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, it's, it's, you know, taking, he's taking advantage of the, of the, of the opportunities. Um, so the biggest winners of the free agents, let's, uh, let's go through a couple of free agents. Um, take on, take on Barkley goes to Philadelphia. Uh, three years, thirty-seven million dollars. It's not about the money. Um, is can say Quan stay on the field? 
And I think for the most part, Saquon Barkley, Saquon Barkley has probably been more durable than I actually have given him credit for. So yeah, I mean, he has been more a little bit more durable than, you, than what you think when you look at the games played versus the games missed. But to me, I'm not paying a running back. I'm, I, I'm just not paying a running back like that. I'm just, I, 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 it's too easy to find a running back in, in the draft and over the course in the NFL. I'm just not, especially a guy who has had some injury issues. So from that standpoint, I don't like the move in Philadelphia. I don't hate it, but it's kind of like one of those, eh, did you have to make this move? Did you have, I mean, did you have to do this? So if he's healthy, if he's on the field, then he has a chance to have to be dynamic. He has a lot of wear and tear on him, even in his short career. He hasn't had a long career, but he has a lot of wear and tear because he plays. He's a tremendous receiver as well as a running back. So he he's going to be you know he's kind of like a, a, a you know a somewhat of a similar a poor man's version of Christian McCaffrey. So if he's on the field, he's going to be productive, and he can catch he can catch balls out the out the backfield as well. But again, he has a it's a lot of a lot of mileage for a guy that's only twenty seven years old. And Calvin Ridley goes to, goes to the Titans four years, ninety two million, fifty million guaranteed at signing. I completely don't understand what what the hell the Titans are doing. The Titans now they're going to draft a quarterback, but they don't. They still don't have a quarterback, and I don't. I'm not overpaying for overpaying a receiver when I don't have a quarterback. Like Calvin Ridley is a very good player. He's not a top receiver in, in this in, in the NFL. He's not. I'm sorry. I'm just not. I, I'm Calvin Ridley's a nice player. He's he's above, slightly above average receiver. He's not. He is not a game changing. He's not a guy that ele- that's going to elevate you offensively. He's not. He's not that. T- he's not that caliber player. And for Tennessee to bring him in with no quarterback to, to me makes it makes less. It, it, it's. It, I don't know what that franchise is doing right now. The owner is absolutely running them to a ground. They were in the conference championship a couple of years ago. They had one of the top young coaches in the NFL. We talked about what happened with, with Rabel. He's done, of course, he's gone. And now you have no quarterback. And now you overpay a receiver who, again, is not a is not a guy that's going to move the need move the needle for you if you're if you're that franchise. That was a, to me is a horrible signing and made zero sense. Made absolutely no sense whatsoever. But that's what happened with that's what happens. With these teams in free agency, you don't want to get to free agency and have to um, be dependent on getting on picking up these players. Most of the players are either over the hill or coming off injuries or just or like these are not these are good players, but these are not players that are going to like change your um, for the most part going to change the trajectory of of you being able to compete for Super Bowls and, and win playoff games. So, it, again, free agency always can be dangerous. And it, it can, more times than not, it can be hit and miss. You see a lot of, you see a lot of bad deals in the NFL free agency. A lot of bad deals. And, again, I don't like, I, I, the Ridley one is just makes, is a ultimately a head scratcher. I mean, Kirk Cousins makes more sense than Ridley. At least Kirk Cousins is a quarterback. Like at least you at least you're paying a productive quarterback who uh, has put up some big numbers and you know has has made the playoffs a couple times. So you can talk yourself into that from that standpoint. You can talk yourself into saying, "Hey, maybe you know an NFC that's kind of wide open that we can make a surprise run." Okay, I there's no talking yourself into this move with Cal Brentley. I'm sorry, this is no there's absolutely no talking yourself into that whatsoever. It made zero sense. Good news for Tennessee, if there's any light at the end of the tunnel, is is only a three point nine million dollar cap hit in the first season. That, I guess that I mean, okay. Well, no, maybe that was that was for Barkley. That was for my apologies. That was for uh, Saquon Barkley. That actually wasn't for Ridley. So from that standpoint, is no good news in terms of, in terms of that signing. Who won the week? The Kansas City Chiefs. Like, and it's not even close from an NFL standpoint. Kansas City Chiefs. First of all, you have um, you have Mahomes restructuring his contact contract to reach to free up twenty one point six million dollars in cap space. Okay, they were able to franchise the Jerry Snee, who was part of one one half 
part of one half of probably the best cornerback duo in the NFL with, with um, in terms of uh, Trent McDuffie, who was all pro this year. You sign Chris Jones, one of the best defensive players in the league. Okay, you get him locked up uh, for, the, for the foreseeable future. And now you have other moves to, to make, possibly small moves, no big moves, but they, they're they going to come back with their core and they're going to be favored to go to go to and win a third straight Super Bowl. And, you know, it, like they clearly had the best free agency. It's not even close. Like, listen, uh, give Mahomes a lot of credit. This is what Patrick, this is what uh, he wants to win. You know, he wants to, he wants to win championships. Brady used to do the same thing with New Orleans. And you know Mahomes is going to make up that money easily. He's going. He's in a million State Farm commercials. He's the face of the league, so that he understands the game. He understands the, the, the law. He understands that that money is going. He's going to get that money on the back end. Um. So and he's getting. He's only what he's twenty seven years old. He's going to sign another mega contract before it's said and done. Like he's going to like this guy is going to sign a. When it's all said and done, he will be probably the highest paid player in NFL history as far as total, as far as career earnings. When it's said and done, but he's smart, smart to know that hey, if you want to keep this thing going, if I want to catch Brady, uh, come close to catching Brady, win five, six, maybe possibly seven Super Bowls, this is what this is what has to be done. He understands that as as, as a, you know, we have an excellent team. We have a we, we draft well. We have a ton of talent, and he wants to get. He understands that they're going to probably have to upgrade their receiving core. So they clearly won the free agency thing. I, I don't think it's even close. Like they clearly won it. Um. So Kansas City wins the week. Um. You know, in, in regards of the regards of free agency and, and just all around. Hello, real thoughts before I let you go. So Aaron Rodgers um, came out this week that he was one of the choices of uh, to be a, a vice president candidate from uh, from Robert Kennedy Jr. The other one, of course, was was, was Jesse Ventura, the governor of Minnesota. Um, Rodgers, of course, is you know this makes all the sense in the world. You know, anti vaxxer He's been on that tip. Conspiracy theorist Robert Kennedy Jr., who is a just absolute basket case. The guy's a nutcase to say the least. You know, you know, just is basically living off a name. Has no political skill and and whatsoever. He's just like basically, he's just a Kennedy. That's it. He's living off a name. Um, I can see why Aaron Rodgers has only won Super Bowl. Um, so you could be a you can't have a bad you can't have a combination of so many bad characteristics, right? So he's a pure, he's a clear narcissist. He doesn't add energy to a team, kind of can, can, can kind of take the life of out of a team, which he did with Green Bay at times. Doesn't uplift, like he doesn't inspire people around him. Now, Aaron Rodgers is one of the most talented quarterbacks ever. So you have to respect his skill set just off his talent alone. This guy's a four time MVP, all all time great quarterback, without question, top, you know probably top 10 quarterback of all time. There's no doubt in Aaron Rodgers' ability. There was a period where a 45-year period, he was the best player in the league. So it's not even about his ability. But when you come, when it comes to winning championships and playing the game at the highest level, you look at the guys who have won championships at the highest level and, and their character. Now, Brady is a, is a, is a MAGA guy. Brady, Brady, if you look it up, Brady has worn, supports Donald Trump. He's worn the Make America's Great hat in the locker room on camera. We've seen, I've seen it. So I'm not saying that supporting that, you know, right wing shit that, that, that you can't be successful in sports. Like there are a number of guys that like that. No, I, I'm not saying that, but Brady, not a narcissist. I didn't hear too many bad things that were said. Did you hear any bad things that were said about Brady? During his time in New England and Tampa, like Brady, Brady came into a room. He uplifted the room. Guys were inspired by his work ethic, TB12, all that. He even had guys working working with him. It, it probably possibly it, it probably caused the split between him and Belichick because he had guys doing on his uh, workout pro, workout program regimen. But guy, but you never like Brady was not ever a divider or somebody that took the life out of the room. 
Never heard that about Brady. And with Rodgers, again, there it's, it's too much. Is you, you're a conspiracy theorist, theorist. You're a narcissist. You don't really. Again, I've, I've heard a number of teammates, ex teammates, completely knock Aaron Rodgers. I heard I, like I, they, no one says good things about this dude. They say they're very consistent in terms of what they say. Say, hey, great player, talented, but, but. When you're that talented and when you've had that much success as he's had, there's not supposed to be a but, but there is with Aaron Rodgers. And now, now I can see with how he, with how, with the, with the type of character he has, now I can see why he only won one Super Bowl. Like, I can really see why now. And again, Aaron Rodgers is out there. You know, on Pat McAfee's show, he's out there talking shit every week. Every week, he puts himself in. He like again, clout chasing as well. He does. He, he does stuff for attention. He says shit for attention. He makes he makes it about him. Even his on the field play, and we talked about this with Robert Sapp. When you know, with Robert Sapp uh, during the cover during during podcasts in the past. Not throwing interceptions. That was a big deal for him. It's not so much about the team, but it was about, hey, I don't want that. I don't want those interceptions on my on my record. On my stat line. Lincoln, I never really you really heard ever Aaron Rodgers take accountability. Rarely for, for you know for his play or for the offense or for when, or, for, or, or when he came up small in big games. Rarely. Again, if, you, if you're going to be a quarterback at the highest level and win championships, you can't have all those. You, like, you, like, there has to be a singular focus. And again, you have to be somebody that uplifts a team. Patrick Mahomes uplifted a team. Joe, like John Elway uplifted, a t inspired a team. I mean, for all, you know, and he's a piece of shit as well, but Brett, Brett Favre. Uplifted his team, and we then again we he turned out to be a piece of shit. We understand what he did, Mississippi stealing from from poor people, and the, I mean he like and he's on that mega shit too. But during his during the time he was there, it was about football. He was a, he was an alcoholic as well. I mean he had one vice. He was an alcoholic, which is not great. But Aaron Rodgers has about three or four things that were that are, that are character that are bad, poor characteristic. Or characteristics like far, but even with even with far with the alcoholism, right? And the dick pics that he sent at the that was at the end of his career. When he was a jet, he was already he was done. But <laughs> you never heard people during Brent Favre's career when he's winning MVPs and going to back to back Super Bowls. You never heard his teammates complain about him. They always would say like Brett, you know, we love Brett. We'll run through a wall for Brett. So even he with with some of the shit that he had going on was able to uplift the locker room, not suck the life out of it. One last thing before I let you go. So the draft is coming up, um, and there's already potential for, for this to be a draft where teams are going to just absolutely just shit the bed as far as chasing these quarterbacks. We saw this in the 2021 draft in, in, recent, in the last couple of years. Look at that draft. Class. It has not aged well. Mac Jones traded. Okay. Trey Lance traded. Zach Wilson is Zach Wilson. Justin Fields, we talked about how his, his trajectory is going. He's going to be traded. And Trevor Lawrence. Now I still believe in Trevor Lawrence, but even he has underachieved to where to where he should be, considering he was considered to be a generational franchise, generational talent coming out that draft. So that draft class has been some shit. And part of the reason is a lot of part of the reason why is some of those guys should not have been drafted in the first round, period. And these teams, you know, I heard JJ McCarthy from Michigan is going to possibly be a top five pick. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I watched a number of Michigan games. They won a championship this year. But when I watched them play, I didn't think JJ McCarthy was the reason why they actually won games. I they had I thought they were great defensively. They had a a bruising powerful running game and that was that like jj mccarthy would make some plays 
and he would, you know, not make a critical mistake. And I know he put up excellent numbers, but I didn't think of JJ McCarthy as some as a quarterback that I didn't think, like I didn't even think of him as an NFL quarterback. To be honest with you, to be perfectly honest with you, but you know, if you, if you told me that you want to take JJ McCarthy in the third or fourth round, cool. But JJ McCarthy, a first round pick, a possible top ten, top five pick, like teams, like they are, they have projections that have Minnesota trading up to get him, and I'm like, ooh, that's how that's how franchises get set back like four or five years, like. Josh Rosen was taken in 2018 by the Arizona Cardinals. Josh Rosen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Josh Rosen. So these teams, uh, you know, chasing these quarterbacks. If, if a guy, if I, if I have a, if you, if, if a guy, is, if there's any question marks about a guy, I'm not taking him in the first round. Sorry. I like, I, I'd just rather build the rest of my the rest of my roster up and, and take a chance on a quarterback in the second, third, or fourth round. I'm not take I don't take chances on quarterbacks in the first round. That's how your friend that's, that that is how easily you will set your franchise back three to four to five years. And again, there's no one coming out, even Caleb Williams, who's probably gonna be number one pick. But even he there's no short there's no Andrew Luck, there's no Peyton Manning, like there's no that there's no it guy out there coming out right now that says that 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 we say will, will be a surefire franchise quarterback guy. That guy is not in the draft right now. So teams are going to – there have been uh, – I've seen projections of as many as four to five quarterbacks could be taken in the first round. And I'm like, I didn't see four to five first-round caliber quarterbacks playing college football this year. I'm sorry. I didn't. I watched Bo Nix. I watched uh, – you know, I watched a number of quarterbacks, Caleb Williams. I watched the guy, you know, the, the Carolina kid, Drake May. I like I'm sorry, I didn't see that caliber quarterback playing college football this year. I didn't. I'm not even looking, I'm not even big on Caleb Williams. Be perfectly honest with you. So teams gotta be you gotta be careful. Teams gotta be careful with chasing these quarterbacks in the first round. I'm telling you, it is it goes wrong. The best bet. Jalen Hurts, Lamar Jackson, some of those guys have some of the best bets have gone second and third round. Have gone in the second and third round. Period. You know, Pittsburgh, they they already off Kenny Pickett. You know, they fucked up on him uh a couple years ago in, in, in twenty twenty two. They could have had you know you know who the Steelers could have had instead of Kenny Pickett? Fred McDuffie. Think about that. You pass up on you. You draft the quarterback who you are. Who within two years you're already off him. You bring in Russell Wilson, who's going to start, and you pass up on a on a guy who's now an All Pro uh, cornerback and one of the best young quarterbacks in, in the league, and a Trent McDuffie. So, it, you know these teams will continue to make mistakes at the quarterback. I know is I, I know is as a is a absolute inexact science. There's no you know, but it's very simple to me. If I don't believe that this guy is going to be a franchise championship child quarterback, caliber quarterback, then I'm going and drafting another position where I could where I can have a player impact start on day one, helping my franchise to get to the next level. And I'll find I'll eventually will find a quarterback. But you can't force a quarterback in the NFL draft. It just it doesn't work. Chase you cannot chase quarterbacks in 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 the draft in the NFL. Because history tells us that it has not worked. That's going to wrap it up in this latest edition of the Real Deal Podcast. I will see you next time. So long.